was the size of Princess Diana's staff when you were private secretary? Well, we deliberately kept it very small. There is a tendency in some royal households, most particularly, uh, I would say, in her husband's household, to grow a very large staff. It's like anything else, you know. If, if you've got a big entourage, um, you must be a very big person. But also, in the case of uh, uh, the Prince of Wales, uh, his income derives from investments, not from public uh, support. And his investments, like a lot of other people, did very well in the 80s and 90s. So one way of, of uh, getting through the money is to employ a large staff. And of course, with a large staff, you then acquire all the benefits, but also the drawbacks of a big organization, a bureaucracy. But everybody gets to feel very important. Diana's staff, we deliberately kept very small, partly because we wanted to appear to be um, a different type of royal operation, but also quite practically because I wanted information to flow freely around our small team. So what would you say small is? Oh, well, uh, we ran the Princess Diana operation <laughs> worldwide on, ultimately, on me, um, three secretaries, uh, and a few support staff. And Prince Charles' staff at that time, how many people? Uh, well, it was knocking over a couple of hundred, I think. Um, but I mean, this is, that's not a strictly fair comparison, but the point I make is that, that we wanted to be different. We wanted to be seen to be more responsive, uh, more um, nimble, but also, yeah, more cost conscious. And I, can I tell a little story? Please. Um, before they split up, Charles and Diana twice a year would have a program meeting where they would sit with their staffs and plan their diaries for the next six months. And this had obviously begun when the prince was a bachelor as a kind of a get together with his close advisors to decide what they were going to do. And it had morphed into this huge uh, meeting. Um, the prince's people on one side of a long table and Diana and her people on the other. And the last couple of these meetings that we had, I can remember there was Diana and me, and maybe a lady in waiting, and there'd be maybe 20, 30, 40 people on the other side of the table. It was a stark visual reminder of what had happened to what had been previously a, uh, a united household. Um, but because we were that small, uh, it reflected Diana's own preferences to be responsive, to, to react quickly to things, and she didn't like red tape. She was very good at doing her work, very disciplined, but she didn't like officialdom. So one time, the Prince of Wales was debating whether or not to do a, a particular engagement, and he wondered if his mother might do it instead, and his private secretary said, well, I will write a memo to the Queen's private secretary. And Diana leaned across the table and said, there's a telephone over there. Why don't you pick it up and ask her yourself? <laughs> and he did. Like a man in a date. And he went to the telephone, he picked it up, he got put through to the Queen. The Queen said, yes, of course I'll do it. And he came and sat back at the table and looked at Diana as if she was some sort of a, uh, you know, a miracle worker because everything else was a wonderful British bureaucracy. Diana knew how to cut through it to get what was required. 